Herring River in Wellfleet, Massachusetts, was once a thriving estuary, 1,100 acres of salt marsh between Wellfleet Harbor and the freshwater kettle ponds. It was a nursery for the fish and shellfish that had sustained humans for thousands of years and a natural buffer to coastal storms. The first Europeans to settle here were attracted by the fishing, whaling, and the salt marsh grasses, which they cut to feed their sheep and cattle. But by the late 1800s, the fisheries had been depleted and the hills had been stripped of trees for fuel and lumber. While many abandoned the Cape due to lack of work, a handful of wealthy entrepreneurs banked on a vision of Wellfleet as a future tourist destination. They believed by diking and draining Wellfleet's salt marshes, they could reduce the nuisance mosquitoes while creating more dry land properties. And so the Herring River Dike was built in 1908 and 1909, restricting the two to 300 foot river mouth to three six foot culverts, only one of which allowed salt water into the estuary. Ironically, the lack of tidal flushing caused waters behind the dike to stagnate, perfect for breeding mosquitoes. To drain the water, ditches were dug and the meandering river was straightened and channelized. However, the drainage of the salt marsh triggered a host of unintended consequences. In the early 1970s, the original dike started to fail, allowing more salt water upstream. After lengthy debate, the town decided to rebuild the dike instead of a bridge. 1980, the uh, State Attorney General's office asked the Park Service to collect data. We started doing some water quality sampling. There was a fish kill. We started looking a little bit closer, and lo and behold, things were very wrong. We observed thousands of dead and dying American eels, large eels, all over the bottom, literally thousands. The entire run of herring coming out of the kettle ponds was dying en masse as soon as they hit the estuary downstream of Route 6. And so we realized there was a really serious water quality problem in Herring River. We've got a diked marsh that's spewing out totally acidic water. How acidic? Dissolved shellfish. We knew that if the salt marsh peat were resaturated with water again, with seawater, it would no longer leach sulfuric acid. We knew we needed to restore tides and seawater to some extent but there were concerns about restoring seawater to the floodplain given the many decades of tidal restriction. So some modeling had to be done that simulates the system with field data. The hydrodynamic model simulates what's happening with the movement of water, the exchange of salt, potential movement of sediment transport. This allows you to predict and say, what opening should we consider? What's gonna happen in these various meteorological conditions, as well as sea level rise increases, how the ecological landscape of the Herring River Marsh Complex was gonna change. So that's kind of the power of, of the modeling. And it also helps guide that engineering design process. The restoration will be managed as an incremental process with multiple pieces of infrastructure to support the return of tidal flow, the largest of which is the Chequesset Neck Bridge. The gates will be oriented to match what the existing flow is. And then only after construction is complete, will the various agencies proceed with raising the tide uh, incrementally at first until they can, they can understand uh, the effects. Then upstream, there's a, a small earthen dike that crosses the floodplain called High Toss Road. That's like a speed bump to the tide. There's a dinky little five foot culvert under here and the whole river has to pass through that. That's way too small for tidal restoration upstream. We need a 30 foot wide opening here. And if you look at old maps like this one, you can see that the, the opening was about that when, before the dike was put in place. The low lying roads have to be raised. The culverts have to be enlarged. There are hundreds of acres of vegetation that will need to be managed and cleared. The marsh is severely subsided up to three and four feet in some areas. We believe that this flood dominated tidal system will bring material sediments back into the marsh and help that marsh regain elevation, but it's gonna need some help. So we intend in certain areas 
to try to accelerate that process. So we have a pilot project underway to test some techniques for using sediment that's been placed on the marsh surface to try to restore that elevation and see how it responds to tidal flow. The purpose behind this entire effort is to restore a damaged ecosystem that is actually impaired under the Clean Water Act to improve the herring fishery and the ecological function of the entire Herring River network. Herring are a really important species of, of fish through the whole ecosystem because everything eats a herring. They, as they go out into Cape Cod Bay and into the greater Gulf of Maine uh, ecosystem, the more herring that go out there, the more they can be eaten by all these commercial recreational spin fish species. 75% of the fish that we consume either eat something that had a time of its life in the salt marsh or actually have part of their life cycle there improves oyster beds, wild oyster beds, which are incredibly important to the town of Wellfleet, and for recreational benefits. There's gonna be enhanced recreational access integrated into the Chequesset Neck Bridge behind us. There's gonna be improved habitat for wildlife viewing. The birding potential in there is gonna just gonna be spectacular. Of course, what we have learned is the best resiliency projects are those where we restore the coastline basically to its natural state. Salt marshes are naturally designed to act as coastal buffers. They help reduce the impact of these coastal storms. And as these storms come in, they dump sediment in the systems which allow these marshes to grow. And as they grow, they stay at a level that's not going to be flooded by sea level rise. The level of both state and federal resources that are being brought to bear on this project uh, it's pretty unprecedented, and the scope of the project is unprecedented. And I think we really felt that it was a model for what we should be doing in, in, in coastal New England, uh, you know, and, and across the eastern seaboard. The Friends of the Herring River have done unbelievable outreach to get people on board and build consensus around the importance of this project. So it's a real success story in uh, community organizing and listening to people and having flexibility while never letting go of the core mission because this is really an expression of a community believing in its, in its future, believing in its tomorrow, believing in its children.